We are going back to 1972 in this video. We're going to see what the old timers had to deal with when they built Craftsman kits. This is Jacob's Fuel from Fine Scale Miniatures. This is kit number 100. Uh, apparently is one of 1200 that was produced and it was released in December of 1972. Fine Scale Miniatures, of course, is the company founded by George Selios, the famous model railroader and he was the builder of the Franklin and South Manchester Railroad. The first kit came out in 1967, uh, and this is apparently the 12th kit to come out, if my sources are correct. I'm not exactly sure how they cut the wood for this kit. Uh, I had thought that uh, all the modern kits used lasers, but of course in 1972 there probably was not uh, very affordable lasers to be used. This kit seems to be mostly scale lumber. We have some shingles, uh, we have some signs, we have some cardboard cutouts. Uh, there's some metal pieces and some plastic pieces for windows. The kit consists of about five to seven sub-assemblies. Each is bagged in their own separate bag. So the first one we're going to work on are the three bins. Like most kits, one of the first things I have to do is add bracing to the wood panels. One of the really nice things about this kit is most of the lumber is pre-cut. You can see the pre-cut bundles there on the desk. However, the bracing is not pre-cut and the trim is not, so you have to cut those yourself. I sprayed the wood panels with a gray enamel primer to prevent warping or any kind of damage from the water-based acrylic paint, but I don't think this was really necessary. So now I'm just assembling the panels and I'm using the grid on my mat as a guide to keep it square. Interestingly, the fine scale miniatures kit that was released prior to this one was a coal bunker and it looked like it shared a lot of the same components as this kit. This kit has over 600 pieces, but most of that is pre-cut lumber. It's not particularly difficult to build but I do have some experience building wood kits from various different manufacturers. So you have to think back to 1972 and the typical buyer of this kit probably had no experience building wood kits. I bet a lot of these sat unfinished. The edge of the bin requires some sanding so that the floor fits flush. I'm doing that with an emery board. Now it's time to build the supports. I photocopied the diagram from the instructions so that I could lay it flat on the desk. I also didn't want to damage the original instructions with the glue. There are three sets of supports for each bin and there are three bins. This is where it is really convenient that the wood is all pre-cut. Only the diagonal supports are not pre-cut. The wood in this kit had a lot of fuzzy splinters on the surface. Normally I would rub the wood with steel wool to remove the splinters because they become much more visible when you paint them. But in this case, the pieces were short, so I didn't do that. It's pretty noticeable in the final build, so I probably should have. Here is what is probably the most difficult part of the assembly. Each of the bins has two support boards on the bottom. The support structures go in notches that you have to cut in the support boards. The trick is to get each of the notches on the bins lined up exactly. Otherwise, the bins will want to sit at different heights. So I'm using this piece of lumber to make sure that the notches line up. Now I add the supports to the bottom of the bins. These diagonal pieces are not pre-cut. You have to cut them yourself. Thank you. 
Now I add the exterior bracing. These are all pre-cut as well. For the exterior bracing, you do have to cut these little short pieces that stick out the sides. I think there's like 72 of them. You have to cut out these little paper rectangles. These simulate the metal plates that are used to hold the structure together. These get glued onto the external supports. Then there will be bolt heads that are glued on top of these and around other areas of the external supports. Now it's time to glue the three bins to this piece of cardboard that supports the roof. The next part of the build is what he calls the loft, which is on top of the bins. It starts out, as always, with some bracing and some trim. The shingles for the roof come in sheets of paper like this. The individual shingles are already cut, but you have to cut out the rows. The easiest way to do this is to tape the piece of paper to the board and cut it off with a razor blade. You really have to make sure that you cut your rows even and straight. For as early as this kit is, this seems like a pretty easy way to put shingles on a roof. You cut the roof panels out of sheets of cardboard that are provided, and he has lines to indicate where the shingle rows need to go. I attached the shingle rows using white glue, and I basically did one row at a time and waited for the glue to dry before attaching the next row. The loading dock assembly is kind of interesting and pretty easy. All of the boards are pre-cut to length. He gives you a piece of wood that is about the size of the loading dock, and then you just glue the individual strip boards onto the piece of wood. This is much easier than framing your own loading dock, but the disadvantage is you can't build a dock with boards missing. Now I add the rafters to the roofs of the loading dock. These rafters are also pre-cut. This small shed is cut out of cardboard and then you add wood beams on the corners. This gets covered in tar paper. The kit includes sheets of black paper to use as tar paper. You have to cut it into strips. This paper is really nice stuff. It has a nice texture and a nice thickness. It's used for the walls of one of the sheds and also for the roof of the sheds and the conveyor. Now it's time to build the conveyor. The conveyor starts as this solid block of wood. Three sides of it are scribed. The fourth side will get a roof so it won't be visible anyway. The angles on the ends are already cut, and they're cut pretty accurately. You have to be fairly accurate in your placement of these supports for the catwalk, so I mark the distance on a ruler with masking tape. The handrail supports for the conveyor catwalk are cast metal, so I'm attaching those with super glue. This is actually really convenient. 
makes it a lot easier to attach the handrail. Fine Scale Miniatures is known for really high quality metal castings with their kits, but in this early kit, the castings aren't as impressive as with the later kits. With all of the sub-assemblies complete, it's finally time for painting. I decided to use the Vallejo Old and New Wood Effects Kit, and I'm following the techniques for using old wood. I'll put the colors on the screen, but the first color is a primer color. It's not particularly visible, but I think that they use it because it's cheaper than the main colors. I've used this paint set a lot in the past and really liked it, but on this kit, I wasn't particularly happy with it. I thought it gave everything a little bit too much of a military olive green color. It's probably all of that Israeli sand. In previous kits when I used this color, I always applied some kind of a building paint color over top of it. In this case, I didn't do that. I just left this as the natural wood color. This kit has a lot of surface area, so it took a lot of paint. You'll notice I don't use a paint booth, but I do wear a respirator. It would be pretty difficult to build this as a standalone building. The conveyor and the loading docks just are not really well attached to the building. Everything would be too fragile. So I decided to build it as a diorama. Here I am laying out the position of all of the elements. This will also give me a chance to practice working with scenery. My scenery skills just aren't that great yet, so I can use any chance for practice that I can get. The next step in painting was a wash of Vallejo Dark Gray. There's so much surface area that this took a lot of the wash and the wash is expensive, so I kind of regretted starting out this way. I never did use this wash on the support legs. Next, I did a dry brush of Tamiya Gray. Dry brushing on this kit is a little bit difficult because all the support elements interrupt the flow of the brush. At this point, I was pretty unhappy with the way the painting was going. It just wasn't looking the way I wanted. So I decided to switch to artist oils. Of course, the disadvantage of artist oils is it takes about a week for the paint to dry before you can do anything else on top of it. But it gives you several days to make adjustments to the paint. So here I'm giving the supports a wash of black artist oils. I also went back and did a gray wash over much of the building. That was an attempt to kind of get rid of the military color. So now back to the plywood base. The kit includes this metal grate. The track runs over the metal grate and the idea is that the hopper cars dump their coal loads down through the metal grate and the conveyor takes it up into the building. So I had to cut a hole in the plywood for the grate. Now I'm adding the trim pieces that go around it. Before adding any ground cover, I like to paint the base with a brown latex paint. This will prevent you from seeing the wood through any sparse areas of the ground cover. This is just a latex house paint. Pick out a color that's appropriate for the region that you're modeling. Make sure you get a matte finish. I'm going to put a small amount of coal in the pit underneath the grate. So to support that on the underside, I'm gluing this black piece of paper. For the coal, I'm just using Woodland Scenic's Fine Black Ballast. In preparation for the ground cover, I paint the area with matte Mod Podge. For the area underneath the building, I'm using this Woodland Scenic's Fine Earth. Then, for the area in front of the building, I'm using this Woodland Scenic Scrabble. After I lay it down, I will spray it with some Scenic Cement and also hairspray to seal the gravel. I'm 
I'm using this turf material along the edge of the diorama. I'm using hairspray to seal the gravel, but you really have to spray it on thick. You almost have to have a puddle of the hairspray in the gravel area. After waiting about a week for the oil paints to dry, I can now add weathering powders to the building. I've covered the windows so that when I spray with a sealer, the windows will not fog up. I'm mostly using brown weathering powder, but I also use some black underneath where the coal chute is and on the roof. For the track, I just used a piece of Atlas Flex Track and glued it to the base. Now that I know the position of the different elements of the building, I can apply Mod Podge to the base and apply ground cover to the remaining areas. I'm applying black ballast to the coal bin and I'm also using the black ballast as ballast for the track. I also spill a little bit extra to look like spilled coal. Once all the ground cover is in place, I mist everything with wet water, which is water with a little bit of disc detergent added that breaks up the surface tension. Then I spray everything with Woodland Scenics Scenic Glue. I wanted the area to look a little bit overgrown, so I apply static grass around the edge of the diorama. I'm still pretty inexperienced with static grass, so this was a good chance to gain some experience. After everything had dried, I gave the whole base a light overspray of brown using an airbrush. This helps to tie together the colors and kind of mute the contrast that's in the gravel. Now it's time to attach the building to the base. I use this Vallejo European Splash Mud to make muddy wet spots in the gravel area. I'm also going to fill in a couple areas with AK Interactive Puddles to create some puddles. I don't know that this kit is going to make it onto my layout. I really bought it because I wanted to see what the older fine scale miniatures kits were like. I bet this was pretty interesting in 1972, but by today's standards, it's not really that exciting of a building. Although it's pretty realistic and I think it's based on a real prototype, it's a little bit awkwardly shaped to go fitting on a layout. Their newer kits are a lot more interesting in my opinion. Well before we get to the good pictures, let's take a look at this one. One of the problems using artist oils is brush strokes. You have to really be careful about that. One of the things I like is that you can come back a day later and you can look for brush strokes and you can get rid of them by adding a little more paint thinner. In this case, I failed to do that and this side of the building has some pretty noticeable brush strokes. Now they're kind of hard to get rid of. With that ugliness out of the way, let's look at some of the better pictures.